Welcome to episode two of Liquid Velvet Literature with your host, The Midnight Mauler. Nietzsche, the trouble with happiness. Now, everything I touch turns out to be wonderful. Now I love any fate which comes my way. Who feels like being my fate? This is Huckleberry Who and his continuation of a Mark Twain classic. A novel, New Method of Sensitivity Training. It is a small one-room Louisiana jailhouse with iron bars and a searing tin roof in which the boy is imprisoned. Thirteen years old, the freedom-loving child has committed the ultimate crime against humanity and has been caught red-handed, and so he must suffer its justice. The boy spends much of his time standing on his cot, hoping to nab some fresh air and to better see out the window, wincing painfully when one of the fingers clinging to the window sill, accidentally brushes against the scorching bars. In the corner of the window cowers a tiny black widow. The boy has named the pest Polly. He lets Polly be, mostly, afraid of her nature to bite. More so, he pities her, she being stuck in her own prison, what with the blue lizard awaiting it on the inside wall and a tarantula on the outside and nary a breeze to parachute away upon. Yes... Much like the boy, the spider finds herself too curing alone in this postmodern pickle jar. Yet, it is not just these two with troubles. The infernal little environment is safe for none, as the blue lizard has his own worries, tasting white chicken and sharing a room with our starving boy. And outside, a piper has spotted the tarantula, and a moccasin has curled itself up in the shade of the jail's wall, and a gator roars angrily from out the bayou. And all this while, a dusty devil of buzzards circles ever higher up the blue clear sky above. It is a rough place for a boy out of tobacco, his every craving unsatisfied, a hellish though deserved place. But do not pity him. The boy has committed a crime, many crimes, in fact. He is a criminal who first and mostly has foregone God. Beside that, though, the boy has killed the father who resented him and has escaped the widow who would gentrify him, festering him with sentimental matriarchal rules. This boy has run, rafted, and fished, and wished, and smoked, and joked, and done it all naked and shoeless and free of guilt or shame till now. So you see, he is the vilest sort and is deserving of all that comes to him, the happy little shit. But those are not his worst crimes, not by a long shot. The boy has also lied and stolen. He stole a man's property and ran away with it. He pretended sickness and death to keep that property. He resorted to trickery to evade its recapture. The boy had the fucking gall to take another man's man and give it hope, friendship, and freedom. Good God, you may ask, what in thunderous tarnation is wrong with the lad? But no worries. He is finally caught, called out by the righteous throngs. Because, incredibly, even these are not his worst crimes. He is much more nefarious than a liar, a thief, a murderer, or a happy child willing to risk his free way of living just to save another from bondage. This lad is so much worse. This boy has allowed a bad word into his 150-year-old narrative, a hurtful word, and he has allowed it in on purpose, his intent to shock and to disgust, and to apply a liberal coat of guilt across the wall of humanity he fully intended to tear down when he began narrating the story and unveiling the fucking hypocrisies surrounding him. But instead, humanity has torn him down, Huckleberry indeed. God have mercy on this poor boy's soul. For we, with our outraged volumes of feelings, shall have none. And this is White Wolf 32 with Trigger Warnings.
We live in a world where my poems must be prefaced with trigger warning contains something. Suddenly the agony that forms substance is to be treated like broken glass, a sign marking the landmine underneath in the hopes that it will alleviate its danger. But poetry is built upon pain, like the shock of being immersed in cold water. If I tell you the ending, will you want to stick around for the journey? I have depression. I have anxiety. I am neurodiverse. I am queer. These are all things society has told me to hide, to censor, in the name of preserving the peace. I have been told not to talk about my experiences with suicide, with self-harm, with addiction. It could hurt someone. It could scare someone. Poetry is my way of sharing my experiences, a guidance, a light shown down into the black hole of my mind in the hopes of someone casting down a rope. Now, even among my art, even among like-minded friends, I am expected to censor myself. I am expected to predict and anticipate the reactions of others and then prevent them. But those reactions are what makes my feelings real. I want to share what I feel even in my darkest moments. I want people to see my life as it is with shock value that jumps out from behind street corners and leaves you shaken, just like it left me shaken. I want to be able to share my opinions. I want to be able to live. I want to shove the research in their faces that proves trigger warnings are ineffective. They do not protect us. They do not prepare us. They only prevent us from authenticity. But I cannot say that. It would make waves. It would be disturbing. So, I guess I should preface my research with trigger warning contains facts that might prove you wrong. Contains facts that might scare you. Because trigger warnings will not stop the flashbacks. They will not lessen the anxiety. They will not stop the self-destructive thoughts that run rampant in your brain. You must do that yourself. With work, with therapy, with time. And that's hard, that's scary, that's dangerous. We are all searching for a quick fix and may have latched on to trigger warnings as the solution, but alas, healing is long and slow. It is not as simple as a warning. If it was, wouldn't we have recovered already? Trigger warnings are an easier solution. They prevent us from looking inward, from asking the hard questions. If trigger warnings don't work, what will?